Good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church, Normandy. It is April 11th. We're going to start with the 261 Lord of the Dance. I invite you to stand. <laughs>
She's still in the hospital, but she is she's doing well. Good, that's what we want to hear. Uh, we also want prayer for Rhonda's husband Bill, daughter, grandson. Also for Taylor Chalk. I saw Miss Chalk last night at the livestock dinner. Gerald Weiss, Caitlin and son. Okay. Kay Martin, whose son will be memorialized next week. He uh, had COVID for about five months, came home two weeks and died. Tammy DeLaGarza's mom, Letha's step-great-grandson, Seth, and Sarah Lundy, and Gary Erskine, and my brother-in-law, Walter Trailer, who refuses to go to the doctor, but they'll be down there soon to hammer on his head. Yeah. yeah. Gary is doing very well. He's at home now. He's at home, so he's doing real well. Okay. Feeling good. Good. Also, uh, pray for Mario Cornish. Him and his wife are both aides at our school. His brother died this, this weekend. We don't know any of the particulars, but pray him up. Uh, <clears throat> pray for those who lost family members or friends of the last week. Uh, those in care facilities, colleges, the military. Those suffering from COVID-19, cancer, and other uh, illnesses, this church, county, state, and our nation, and Gulf Coast residents. I'm also to announce your apportionment sheets are scattered on all the pews back there. 
Look at them. I'm telling you, look at them real, real good. Don't be bashful. Just write a check and bite the bullet. And uh, hand it in. Does anybody else have any announcements? Our cash show went, with, went off without a hitch. But uh, is there anything else we need to announce? Shooting and Brian. Yeah, pray for those involved with the shooting of Brian. Uh, we learned that the, the man who died is the son of a United Methodist pastor. Um, his mom, um, Susan Smith, is the pastor at Grand Saline up in the Tyler area. And but all of those, the trooper and all the rest who were injured, want to lift up them and their family. Didn't affect his brain. My daughter-in-law works in the in the barber shop where him and his little four-year-old. So. Anybody else on our prayer sheet? Okay. All right. Y'all have a good week. Let's go for prayer. Loving God, we are grateful for the gift of today and for all the gifts that you give to us. Lord God, we pray uh, that you would be with us in all the opportunities you provide for us during the week. Opportunities to love others. Opportunities to serve others. Opportunities to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord God, to bring peace, to bring healing, to be ambassadors to Jesus Christ. Lord God, we pray for all of those we mentioned and the many that uh, we didn't mention, that you would be with each one, that you would bring healing, and we just ask you, God, again, for opportunities to share your love. And we pray this all in Jesus' name as we join the prayer he taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Let's join now in the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear the joy that you say to us today. Amen. verses 6 through 10, and this is Paul, and he's speaking to the churches of Galatia. I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who you call you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you, and you want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven, should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you, let that one be accursed. As we have said before, so now I repeat, if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, let that one be accursed. Am I now seeking human approval or God's approval, or am I trying to please people? If I were still pleasing people, I would not be a servant of Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I just now stand and let's join together in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father.
heart. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So last week was Easter, and we celebrated Christ being raised from the dead, and, and what that means for us, and the relationship that we can have with God because of that. And so I asked the question last week, and I, I, mean, I asked it kind of thinking about the disciples, well, what were the disciples thinking? What now? What's next? And we know from reading the Gospels after the resurrection that the disciples seem to be mostly hiding. Mostly unsure, thinking, well, maybe we're next. Maybe we're the next one to be to be arrested and tried and crucified. And so they were kind of pretty much keeping a real low profile. And, and we read that Jesus appeared to them, continued to teach them and prepare them for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so as I was thinking, okay, well, let's answer the question, well, what now for us? We just celebrated Easter. What, what can we do next? And I got to thinking, you know, something we could do is we could go to one of the earliest books from the, from the New Testament. And Galatians is perhaps the earliest of the books, written sometime just before or just after 50 A.D. And it's thought that Galatians was, if not the first book that we have the written manuscripts of, it was, it was among the, the very first. And at the heart of Galatians is Paul's presentation of the gospel that we are saved by grace through through faith and it seems you know we we, 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 we didn't read the first very first kind of the opening and greeting of the letter but by verse 6 Paul is into the meat of what he wants to, to say and that is that they are now grabbing hold of and, and, and using a gospel difference the one, he present, the one that he presented when he was there. You know, and, and sometimes it's not too difficult. We get confused ourselves. I read about an author, uh, Sidney Sheldon, actually, how he had just purchased a Rolls Royce, a blue Rolls Royce, and how a few days after he bought the Rolls Royce, he was out shopping, and he's in the store, and when he comes out, he gets in the Rolls Royce and is trying to drive off, and he's tapped on the shoulder. There was a man sitting in the back seat, and uh, he says, what do you think you're doing? And the author says, well, this is my Rolls Royce. I'm trying to drive it off. And the man says, no, sir, this is my Rolls Royce. It's not yours. He says, well, it is mine. He took his Rolls Royce key. He puts it in. It won't start. It's not his Rolls Royce. He was driving his wife's Volkswagen that was parked just behind the blue Rolls Royce. <laughs> that was the so here's the thing. Sometimes we think we get it, but we, but we don't. And what, what had happened is, is there was tension in the early church between, between Jews that had decided to believe in Jesus and Gentiles and where all of the rules and rituals fell that the Jews practiced and whether the Gentiles needed to practice those rituals or not. And we've already talked many times about how the Pharisees and the Sadducees took the rituals, took the rules, and they knew more about the rituals and rules than they knew about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And how we want to be careful that we don't get so wrapped up in our rituals, get so wrapped up in our rules, that we grab onto those rituals and rules and somehow forsake having a relationship with God. That's something we don't want to do. And that's what was happening in Galatia. And, and Paul was writing to, to try to let them know that they needed to, to not jeopardize their relationship with God because of rituals and, and rules. Um, we, we, we are, you know, scholars pretty much agree that Galatians was written by Paul, and that's amazing because biblical scholars hardly agree on anything. And so this is good news for us. Uh, we, we know that uh, we're not exactly sure, like I said, when it was written. And a lot of the when it was written depends on who it was written to. And there's two kind of theories that it was written to the churches that were in the northern part of Galatia. And if that's the case, those were uh, churches that Paul visited on his second missionary journey. And, and if it was written to the churches in the southern part of Galatia, then those were churches that Paul visited on the first missionary journey. 
And, and I don't know that, that it matters too much to us whether it was written before 50 or 50 or just after 50 or whether it was to the northern churches, the southern churches. But I think it's helpful for us to just remember that they, this is a letter written to churches in, in a region there in Asia Minor. At the heart of this is Paul's message of, of, of salvation through grace. I think Ephesians 2 8 says it well. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. You know, and, and it's faith that brings us the forgiveness of God. It brings us reconciliation. We are a people of forgiveness. We are a people of reconciliation. And, and I think Paul is unique amongst all the folks in the Bible that demonstrates to us as the church is how we are to forgive, how we are to receive. Now, Paul, before he was called Paul, was called Saul. And Saul was a great persecutor of the church. Paul was one who knew all the rules, knew all the rituals, and he went out and he would have people executed who did not. We, we, we read in, uh, in Acts chapter 7 that when Stephen was stoned, Saul is standing there witnessing the stone. I'm reminded of what Stephen, Stephen said at his stoning. In Acts uh, chapter 7, verse 60, we read that Stephen cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this against them. And then after he said that, the, the Bible tells us that, that he died. Just uh, two chapters later, in chapter 9, Saul is converted. He's traveling to Damascus. There's a bright light. And when the light hits him, he is blinded, and he hears the voice of God asking why he's persecuting his people, and then he's, he's taken to a house to, to recuperate and do whatever, whatever you did back in those times whenever you've gone blind. And then, there, then there's a, a disciple named Ananias. In, 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 in chapter 9 of Acts, we read that the Lord said to Ananias in a vision, and Ananias said, Here I am. And, and the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying. He has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias, he knew who Paul, he knew who Saul was. And so he says, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen. Bring my name before the Gentiles and the kings, before the people of Israel. So Ananias then goes to Saul, lays his hands, prays for Saul, and Saul is able to see. And then Ananias is the one who then brings Saul to the church, to the fellowship of believers. And from there, Saul begins his ministry, later to be called Paul. And, and I sometimes think that it's Ananias, who is one of the great heroes of the New Testament, because he's the one who was obedient to go to Saul whenever I imagine most believers would not have done so. And the fact, you know, and, and like I said, I think that Saul sort of shows us in, in, in his journey from being a persecutor of the church to being a leader of the church, that journey is a journey that, that we should look for. That is who we are as people. People who are enemies once forgiven by God, become our friends, even our leaders. And, 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 and we just have to be ready and open. We have to forgive and listen to God and, 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 and just trust. But sometimes we are, sometimes we're apathetic and we, and we lose interest and we maybe don't Maybe we just don't care as much. Sometimes we, 
we have so many interests. You know, we were interested in God, but we're interested in so many other things that we don't quite we don't quite have the priority in following Christ that we, we maybe should maybe should have. Sometimes we're we're just self-absorbed. Absorbed with ourselves and our needs and our wants, that we have no time or interest in anything or anyone else. You know, we, we're to be true witnesses to the good news, examples of what Christ has done for us, and, and then we we hopefully, as folks see us, they see Christ. I heard about this uh, ballpoint pen salesman. <clears throat> How many of you have ever met a ballpoint pen salesman? I'm just wondering. <laughs> ballpoint pen salesman. All right, you guys hang with me if you will. He was out selling pens and, and he was selling them to businesses. So he went into a business, he sold an order of 500 pens. He starts writing up his order of 500 pens and immediately the business owner just stops him and says, Stop right there. I'm canceling my order. I'm not getting any pens. And if you would, please leave. Well, the salesman, you know, salesman, he didn't quite leave right away, but he kept trying to say, well, I'm, you'd order the pins, let's do the order. The, the, the business owner had nothing to do. He says, it's okay, I'm not getting the pins, you can go. Well, somewhere between just inside the door and just outside the door, the salesman turns back to the business owner and asks, why are you not getting this order of pins? And the business owner said, well, when you filled out that order, you were filling it out with a pencil. You don't even use the product you're trying to sell. How many of us can be accused of the same thing? We, we, we like to think that we're Christian, but often our practice is something that's different. What now? It's just after the week after Easter, and where are we going to go from here? What now? I like, I like the way it says this in, in Philippians chapter 2, and this is about halfway through verse 12. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for God's good pleasure. And that's what I hope we all will do, is we will be doing what we can to follow Christ faithfully. One of the aspects of our work here are our covenant groups that we started in Lent. A covenant group, for me, is one of the best ways I know to stay on top of my discipleship. A covenant group is a small group of folks that gather together, and they work out amongst themselves things that they can do to follow Christ. And then every week, they list out those things, and they, and they answer to one another, yes, I was able to do this this week, or no, I wasn't able to do it. And, and, and the point is not legalism. The point is trying to be faithful disciples, trying to do the things we all want to do, to follow Christ. As I've told several of the groups when I meet with them, you know, if this becomes, if this isn't joyful, if this isn't helpful, let's do something else. And if you haven't had the opportunity yet to take part in one of our groups, we have a group that meets at 4 p.m. this afternoon. We've got another group that meets on uh, Monday night at 7, Tuesday morning at 7.30. That group usually meets at the place, but the place is closed for renovation. So we're meeting here at the office area on Tuesday mornings at 7.30. And then Thursday morning at 11, we're also meeting in the office area. And then at 9 a.m. on Sunday, out at Flynn uh, for uh, Sunday school. If you haven't had a chance to take part or to just come and see what a covenant group is about, I would just encourage you to make that happen. I've also offered to several folks that these times don't quite work. If you could get one or two others, so two or three, if two or three folks find a time, I would be happy to meet with that group at that time, at whatever place, and we can get another group going if that is better or easier for folks. Don't forget that, that, that our salvation is by grace through faith. That's it. 
And then we work out as best we can from Scripture, from our relationship with one another and our faith community, what it is we do to faithfully follow Jesus Christ, to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Because what we know is what we read in Ephesians, Ephesians 2, verse 8. For, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your doing, it is the gift of God. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your love and for your grace, and we thank you for the relationship that we can have with you. Lord God, help us to stay away from, from rules and rituals that get in the way of our having a, a true relationship with you. And help us, Lord God, to love you and love others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
There are apportionment lists on the pews, apportionment lists here in the rail. I think there's some even in the in the office area. And, and every every year, our church uh, gives to what's called apportionments, and these are these are basically requests from our denomination or assignments from our denomination for ways we can help the work that our churches all do together. United Methodist churches are are uh, united together to do work, and the work that we can do collectively is so much more than we can do individually, and this helps us to fund that work. And so what has happened in the past year is people have signed up for different ones of the apportionments, and uh, then, 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 then when you sign up for that, then, then we ask that you, that you pay that amount, whatever it is. And I know some of them are pretty big, and I think Cindy said it last week, that it's okay to partner up with people or to just take a portion of one, and, and to do that, and uh, someone was, was asking me about it, um, I guess in one of the company groups, they're asking me about it, and said, well, what is this? Why is this different? And, it, and it's, not, it's not much different than, than putting offering in the plate, because what happens if any of these are not completely covered by folks signing up for them, then we're going to cover them as a church, because that, that's just who we are and how we do it. But, but this is an opportunity for folks if they want to do kind of a special offering to help us with our apportionments to do that. And those lists are all over. And I appreciate y'all in your generosity. Uh, the plates are here at the rail in the back in the office. We encourage you to leave your offering there. And we also invite you, if you would, to uh, hold the rail offering. We have baskets up on the rail. And our rail offering for this month in April is to the Hope Pregnancy Center. And then uh, if you would mail an offering in, it's Post Office Box 267, Norman G, 77871. And I invite the congregation to stand and let's sing our doxology together.